Today, we have got three presenters speaking to us today. In the past, we've only ever had one. So this is um, quite a big one. And the topic today is using various computational methods to try and extract more information out of our vaults. So we've got three different topics that are going to be spoken on today. And each of them is a way to kind of learn more from this information that we've already put in. The first topic, <clears throat> well, the three topics that we're going to hear today are about natural language processing, artificial intelligence, and network analysis. Our three presenters today in order are going to be Ben, who's Phoenix on the Discord, Emil, and Paul Brickman. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we've got these three, all of which, all of whom are very knowledgeable in their field. So it's quite exciting that we've got them to come speak to us today. Uh, starting off is going to be Ben. Um, I'll hand over to him in a sec, but <clears throat> just throughout the talk, if you've got any questions, um, please do post them in the chat. I will collect them and at the end of each presentation, there'll be a chance to ask those questions to the presenter. And then at the end of all three, we'll have a bit of a more general Q&A discussion session. Yeah. And if you do feel comfortable, you can also turn on your mic and camera if you would like to ask the question directly. Okay, cool. With that said, we are recording and we're ready to go. So I'm going to hand over to you, Ben. Please take us away. All right. Thanks, first of all. Um, so I want to give a bit of an introduction to a specific technique. So this is going to be a bit more theoretical and a bit more involved, but I think this is something really fascinating when you hear it the first time, and I really wanted to give this to someone else. And um, I, have, I figured this might serve a bit as, uh, as a means to gain an understanding behind sort of the magic that sometimes happen, happens in different places. Um, so I think it's always nice to sometimes see how a method works or, or roughly how it might work, just so you have a bit of an intuition. Okay. Let me sh show you my slides. All right. So this is about, um, given a note, um, show me similar notes, right? And I figure this might be pretty useful working in Obsidian. If you're inside some node, you might have uh, some area in your sidebar that uh, shows you nodes that are similar to it, right? We, we know this from all the other online tools, like, I don't know, YouTube, whatnot. Almost every service shows you like related content. And I figure, Particularly in um, in this sort of knowledge management, it might be super nice to be able to um, be suggested connections which you didn't explicitly make, right? And I want to go a bit into in bit into depths in in a possible approach that you might use to judge the similarity between um, two nodes, right? And so, like in uh, computer science speak, you could call this document similarity. And uh, this is like the jargon. And if I get confused and say document, just think of a document as a note. Um, this is just because that's what you read uh, everywhere. Right. So we want to give a note. We want to find other notes that are similar to it. We want to rediscover, so to speak, lost knowledge and awards, like stuff that we didn't mention explicitly. But a big challenge about this, how do you define this similarity in the first place? Because up until now, we've only had a very vague notion of this, right? And even before this, how do we even represent a document, right? We need to judge the similarity on something, on some sort of data. And often this is a crucial step. And then the actual similarity, determining the actual similarity is fairly easy. It very often depends on the representation. So, for now and for for the scope of this uh, presentation let's just stick with intuition that two documents are similar if they contain similar words this seems pretty reasonable right so if two texts are about the same topic they are fairly likely to contain the same the same words right seems reasonable so we can stick with this for now okay so how do we quantify this how do we 
put into numbers if two documents contain the same word, right? Um, well, first of all, we need to sort of get a grasp on all the entirety of words that we have. We call this a dictionary of terms, so to speak. And now for simplicity, let's just assume we only talk about cats and dogs, right? And for a start, we sort of keep track on how often each term, so each word, uh, appears in a document, right? So if I have one document that says, or, or one note that says, I like both cats and dogs, but I like cats better, you would pretty much keep a huge list or a vector if you're mathematically inclined, where at the position for cats, you keep a two, uh, and at a position for dogs, you keep a zero, right, uh, in this example. Or if you're absolutely crazy in another note and just write dogs, 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 you put down a four in a position for dogs. In this way, for each document, you have one list or one vector, so to speak, uh, in which you denote the frequencies of words. <laughs> Right, and this you can call the term frequency. I'm giving this a name because we will refer to it later. And the term frequency it depends on the term naturally and on, on the document, right? But then again, if you speak about docs all the time in all the, in all the nodes all over the place, mentioning it a few times somewhere is not very important or not very informative, right? So to sort of alleviate this, we do another trick and uh, look at how in how many documents a term uh, occurs overall like across your entire world or your entire library right so this is the document frequency and how many documents does a term t appear right and then you can make the inverse document frequency where you put n over document frequency of t where n is, n is the number of all documents so uh if your, if your term appears in almost every document, um, this is going to be a low value. And if it occurs only very, very rarely, this is going to be a large value, right? And then we can sort of combine these two notions to come up with a score for each term in a document, right? So the occurrence of a term in a given document is important if it appears often, and if it does not appear very often in all the other documents. Right, and this is what you call the TFIDF weight, which is the term frequency multiplied by the inverse document frequency. And as I hinted before, like the term frequency is largest if a term occurs often in a document, right? It's just the number of terms. So then for a given document, for all terms, we can keep a list or a vector of uh, TF-IDF scores of this term. So for TF-IDF of term one and document I and so on, right? Now, uh, assume we are given two documents. How do we judge the similarity between these two documents? We said we want to do this based on um, that they contain, contain sort of similar words. And we derived this TF-IDF weight. So basically what we want to do is we want to compare these two vectors. Um, that we obtained both for document one and document two by computing um, the TF-IDF weights for each of the terms that appear. So, okay, but how do you measure the similarity between these two vectors, right? And basically, whenever you you're given a vector, you can sort of think of a vector as this, as like a point in a multidimensional space, right? So, so the purple vector might be this line and the blue vector might be this other line. And you want to judge the similarity be between this. This is just to give a sort of geometric intuition. And so one thing you might think about when I mean, you approach this the first time, you might consider the distance between these two vectors. But um, if you think about this a bit longer, um, you will realize that this is not adequate because really you only care about the distribution of the terms in the document and not the overall weights. Because it might be the case that in two given documents, um, they have exactly the same distribution of terms, but one is just coincidentally longer. But that doesn't mean that the longer one necessarily is more about that topic than the other one. So what you rather want is the angle between these two vectors, which is expressed formally in this case as so-called cosine similarity, if you want to get into this. And this sort of captures like sort of whether the vectors, if you want to think of them as arrows, if they go into, into the same direction. 
So we have now sort of derived a way to, um, to quantify documents, to assess the similarity between documents and um, uh, to, to wrap this up, I want to sort of give another point of view into this, which I think is, is, is very nice, because you can think of the computation of these idea, TF IDF weights of, of these vectors representing them to be an encoding of the documents. And then judging the similarity of these documents is in some sense a decoding of these given encodings, right? And I feel like this encoder decoder perspective is very useful in, in many cases and makes thinking of thinking about things uh, a lot easier sometimes. So I just wanted to give you that on the way since I have the opportunity to talking to you. Okay, that's it from my side. Um, as a side note, you could also call this representation and, and embedding. <laughs> we have this term a lot. Uh, maybe it will come up later in, uh, in another representation or in a discussion. Okay, but that's it really from my side for now. So if there are any immediate questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thanks, Ben. We'll, we'll give it a sec to see if any, any questions come through. Just while if, if someone's typing, is this something that you implement in your own vault? Have you like run this analysis on your notes? No, not yet. <laughs> so this is this is something that I imagine could be doable relatively simple, um, but is also far from perfect because this still has uh, limitations. There's more adequate models, certainly, um, and in particular. So the big advantage is sort of is the simplicity, right? Um, and I would say the bigger disadvantage is that it probably won't work very well with short texts. Which is I feel uh, as one thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but this, this would be a comparison. Um, right. I definitely want to do something like this. I really want to have something that shows me related notes. <laughs> so I feel, so maybe it'll either be this approach or something else. But for now, it's just a concept. Yeah, very interesting. Like I've, I've just started playing with plugins, and I don't think it would be like super difficult to implement. <laughs> but this is a more uh, simple approach, as you said. Yeah. Okay. Um, we haven't got any questions come through on this. Um, so yeah, it, you can still ask questions, anybody, and I'll, I'll pose them to Ben at the end, and you can also put more general questions in the chat. Um, but with that then, thank you, Ben, for presenting on that. Next, we have Emil going to give us his presentation. I don't think the audio is working enough. Uh, muted. You're right, I didn't unmute. <laughs> Oops. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Emil. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Vrije Universiteit of Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. Uh, and I work on the intersection of knowledge representation methods and machine learning. And that's kind of what I will be talking about today. So graphs are usually the type of thing we work on in knowledge representation and language and technology is usually done with machine learning. And then we can see how can we apply this for Obsidian. So the motivation for this is um, I would like to have a very useful representation that I can, can browse through and walk through of my own vault. So a vault usually is a huge bag of text, many ideas, many concepts, but um, it would be nice to be able to get a small representation of your graph and of, of your vault and um, walk through it and have it feasibly in a very nice summarized way. Uh, so what, to this end, I have been working on Juggle. So Juggle is, an, uh, it, it's a different graph view. 
um, where you can uh, show and you can basically uh, create rules for how to visualize a node in your graph. So you can say, um, I want squares, I want certain different kinds of arrows. Um, and it gives a better uh, intuition about what your graph contains because you, you, you can basically link these different visuals to concepts of your graph. And you can also, for example, add things like um, uh, the reason why two things are connected to give a better uh, sense of why why things are interesting and why they are connected. Um, and that, that, that's why I worked on this. So the idea was really to create something that can lay out your fold in a visual way where you can really grasp as much from your fold as possible with as little as possible time. And also it looks ready. So. Um, and yeah, I put some work in it to make sure you can do stuff like view your media and your images and your um, uh, in, in your videos and your graphs. So, but the question here is more: okay, how can we combine this with language technology? Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll talk about some other approaches because I have not implemented any any, any of these ideas, but it's fun to talk about. So for this, I'll be talking about some uh, related um, works related uh, software in the, in the personal knowledge management community. So Codex is a um, very interesting web application that basically simulates an operating system within your web browser. So don't ask me how, but this is basically inside of your web browser and has like all kinds of things like an operating system has. But basically it's like a super fancy note taking system. Like it's kind of crazy. Um, so what you, can, what you can do here is that you can write, write text like Tintin is an enemy of, of, of Muller and then add annotations to this text. Now, just visualize that. It works, okay, it works. So they're writing Tintin is an enemy of Muller. And what they do is while writing this, they annotate Muller, uh, Tintin as an entity called Tintin and say of enemy of that it is like the link, how it is linked to Muller. And this way we can, we can from this piece of text, create a very nice uh, graph that, that, that basically uh, displays information that is inside of your fold, inside of your notes. And you can do the same for Captain Head and, and Muller. And this way you can get a different graph, and really show that Captain Haddock and Tintin are both enemies of Muller. This is a very weird app, but basically this idea would be very cool for Obsidian, where you can just write down some text and have them have it annotate the relations between your graph. It's, it's I think, a, a much more intuitive way of writing and creating data in this way. Problem with this is Markdown, because Markdown is plain text, and we cannot really do this annotation um, while still remaining as nice visually as it is as in their application. So it is something I would maybe be interested in working on, but we'll see. And, and, and the downside of this, of, however, is that annotating is a pretty expensive process because for every sentence that you would write, you would need to link it to some kind of a concept. So um, can we do this automatically, right? So one benefit of of, 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 of linking like this, linking your entities, is that you can also uh, link your entities and your nodes in your graph to external sources of data. So you can say, uh, okay, well, we have a Wikipedia page or a Twitter page or I don't know, a Google knowledge panel, whatever kind of external source of data you have, a paper. Um, it would be nice if you can link your nodes to this data that you have on the internet and make your really your full part as of like a small knowledge graph of the wider knowledge that's available on the internet. Another thing to think about is can we do this automatically? So can we automatically create these kinds of graphs? Uh, there's a lot of fancy research going on with uh, about this with this graph neural networks that uh, actually Ben talked about a, li a little bit uh, earlier. Um, and this is really hard stuff, but what you, what you can do is that you give it a piece of text and it basically says, okay, you know, you're talking here about Barack Obama, you're talking here about uh, America and whatever. You know, you, you can really say, 
these are the things that you talk about in this text. And that's, that's done automatically. And that's, of course, way more efficient than just having to annotate it all manually with your keyboard and whatever. And there are also ways you can do it automatically to link them together. That's called entity linking. So that if you would be talking about Barack Obama another time, but then using the word he instead of Barack Obama, that you would also recognize this as talking about Barack Obama instead of talking about whoever else is in your text. And finally, and that's even harder techn technology, technologically, is relation extraction. So basically, if you give it a bunch of text, what kind of relations are there between these entities? This is a really hard problem that we are actually studying as well in our university, but it's a very nice application of this for your obsidian vault, right? Because you can really easily get an intuition of what you've been writing about in your notes. So I'd like a, like a bit of an idea of what this would look like. There is an application called infra notice. So basically what this allows you to do is that you give it a bunch of text. In this case, there are some tweets that, that, that it is given. And this application constructs a very nice uh, knowledge graph based on the words that I used in this in, in this in this um, in, in the in the uh, text that you input it. In this way, you can basically automatically analyze your text and it links relevant words together. So if words appear together or not, like like I'll show you in the uh, in the video, then they will be next. Then they will they will be connected in the graph. And you can also find out what kind of topics there are. So they so it will basically group um, relevant keywords together, and it all does automatically based on the text that you provided. So you can really see here, you know, talking about Neo 4 j which is doesn't really matter what it is, but basically you can see, you know, Infra Notice talks about this concept, and you can also see where it talks about this in the, in in your tweets. And then if we look at network analysis. We can see that it's also connected to infra notice. So if we are not interested in to see, you know, how it's network analysis to connect to infra notice, we can see, you know, you can do network analysis using Neo4j, and that's that's what's done in infra notice. So you can very nicely browse whatever you've written in your documents like that. And that would of course be a very nice ideal for juggle, you know, um, create all this nice information that you have in your graph and ultimately construct this beautiful graph. Of course, that's technologically a very challenging idea. I mean, it's not something that is like a couple of days of work, but you know, the technology is out there to make things like this for personal knowledge management and really get a very good insight of what your vault contains. So that would be like one of my ideals for an ideal knowledge representation, uh, personal knowledge management system. Thank you. That was that was it. Um, Awesome, thanks, thanks, Emil. Um, so we did have a question come through for Ben. I can put that at the end. Um, send through any questions about this presentation if you have. We can give that a minute or so. Yeah, I have a quick question, mm -hmm. if it's all right. Um, so we talked about um, potentially automatically linking entities, right? Um, but in order to do that, naturally, you first have to recognize the entities themselves, right? And so what I'm wondering is that, um, for instance, so in, in, in my world, it's like a lot of computer science research and stuff, and there's a lot of specific terms. And maybe maybe a lot of terms which aren't proper words, maybe or might not appear in the dictionary or something. And so, how do how do certain certain common uh, or common um, entity extraction methods handle the sort of case? Like, can we can we handle any sort of string, or does it does it really have to be a semantically known word? So I I, I think I, I've not done not done any research in it specifically, but I think what these things mostly do is that they uh, recognize what unique words there are. So if they are used in a, in a unique context where they are um, really talked about instead of just um, used as like a verb or a uh, adjective, I think that's when you can really recognize it. So it's a, it's a bit of a noun, but also a noun that is not used that regularly, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm pretty sure this, this actually they should be uh, rec and recognizing entities that are not common words, right? Because usually 
ent entities that you're interested in are the entities that are unknown to many people, right? So um, I'm pretty sure these systems can do this pretty well, actually. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's very possible. But I'm, I'm not sure about it, the exact technology behind this, something I'm an expert in, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it does it quite well. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, I think I remember basic approaches which are about, which basically work on the sentence structure. Yeah, right yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, nice, thanks. Just, just while you're on that, um, are, the, are these like models, um, is that the right word? Are, are the models like being given a, like a set of grammatical rules so that they can like, more easily pick out the nouns from the sentence and disregard other things, or is it more unsupervised? So this, this depends a bit on the method you use. So um, it used to be indeed more like a rule-based approach where you investigate what kind of you know, language is used and then extract what's most likely entities okay, because of those rules. But I guess nowadays, you know, everyone uses machine learning for NLP methods or for language technology. So I think you'll probably do way better these days with machine learning based methods, like, um, you know, the GPT-3 kind of stuff that uh, Paul will talk about. And I'm, 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 not a, I'm not an expert in this, but this is, this is what I most likely think will be true. Interesting. Okay. Um, we do have a question from Caro asking about that Codex Apple browser operating system. Right. Yeah. So this is, uh, oh, I'll go back to the slide. So this is something that is like close beta or whatever. I'm not sure what it actually, actually, actually it is, but it's also not, it's to me a bit of a mysterious thing, but it looks very cool. Um, so the only thing I know about this is, is basically their Twitter page. <laughs> so twitter.com slash codex editor, and they also have a Patreon. Um, so basically what they are doing is this weird thing where they are um, creating a web-based operating system. Um, let me quickly see if I can find the YouTube. It's always very hard for me to find this because they're... Uh, right here. I'm so glad that the only bar so can quickly find this. So it really just looks like an OS, right? So you can really do all kinds of things like, I don't know, syntax highlighting. So it really shows of, of a note what kind of syntax there is and they've done some really smart stuff so it's basically designed for a social sciences background where you can really put all your data and all your um, id and all your yeah um, what's it called all, all your sources together in one um in one basically place to to research it it's fascinating but it's also a bit weird to me <laughs> Um, the fact that it's a separate OS is really a bit mind blowing, but also makes your service so practical. I even tried it. I did use it. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. It is a bit strange that they've got like such specific tools in a whole operating system. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing the link there. Cool. Um, <clears throat> we don't have other questions for this presentation. Um, again, we might get some along the way, but let us now move to Paul's presentation. Um, you can share your slides there, Paul. Thanks, I'll try to do that now. Does it work? Can you see it? Okay. So, hi, I'm Paul, the creator of Duo which is a virtual assistant for knowledge work. Um, you might have heard some mentions to it in the, in the Obsidian Discord server, but this is the first live demo of some, 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 new, some new features. And the way this will work is I'll just do a quick rundown of what Duo can do through a bunch of examples. And then at the end, I'll also do a short demo of actually using it uh, live. And that will, I think, be the last thing before the, the final Q&A session, right? So um, the way you talk with this virtual assistant is by using a chat. 
um, this is your average Obsidian setup. On the left, you have a random node. This isn't relevant at all right now. It's just a random node. Uh, and on the right, you see this side panel, which is actually the chat you can use to talk with this virtual assistant. Now, it has the same chat mechanics you would expect from a normal instant messaging app. At the top, you have the, the contact and the status, and then in the middle, the, the body of the conversation, essentially, but right now it's empty. In a second, we'll get something in there. Uh, and at the bottom, you just have an input box you can use to basically send messages to this virtual assistant. Right. So, okay, you can use the, this interface to sort of interact with it, um, but what can it actually do? What can you actually do with it? And what your duo can do is actually completely determined by its set of skills, um, its skill set. So you can basically teach it new skills yourself as a user by simply creating several markdown files, which are uh, really straightforward and have a simple structure. I'll go over that in a second. And I'll show you, I'll try to show you how you can basically teach it some useful things. Um, a first general way of doing this is by trying to provide examples of what you of what you want it to do. Um, right. This is the first example of a skill, and I'll just ask you to like for half a minute go through the chat on the right, and I'll continue when you're done. Right, so here I'm asking this virtual assistant to come up with some research questions, to formulate research questions. And the way it knows how to do that from scratch is by using the note on the left. So the note on the left now, it's not a random note, it's uh, relevant here. And its title is formulate research question, which is surprisingly related to what we were doing now. And the way it's structured is that I can use my pointer. I hope you see it. Um, so on the first row, you see a topic and then a research question. Then on the on the following few lines, you see the same structure, sort of you, you just write, this is a normal markdown file, and you just write a topic and then a research question. It's sort of like a pattern. I'm listing a topic and then a research question and so on. And at the end, I have this placeholder, uh, which reads subject. This is filled in automatically when I send it messages. So if I if I ask it formulate a research question about virtual assistants, it will automatically get virtual assistants as the subject of this request and fill this in in this in this file. In a sense, I'll explain it better later. Uh, and then after it does this, it uh, follows this code block in a sense. Write a paragraph starting with uh, what comes beforehand. So basically, by filling in the subject from my command and simply completing the pattern, it knows how to formulate research questions based on specific topics I bring up. Um, so this is what happens behind the scenes. Sorry, behind the scenes for each messages I'm sending in here. Um, and this write a paragraph starting with something is actually just another command I can send it myself. So if in the chat here, I, I ask it write a paragraph starting with something, this is just another command similar to formulate a research question about virtual assistants. So it's all skills uh, building on other skills. Uh, this was probably somewhat confusing, but I hope with a few more examples, it will become more intuitive. Right, so this is a very similar example, and I'll just give you another like 20 seconds to read through the chat. Right, so here there's the same sort of pattern in the file on the left, which specifies this behavior, which is called find related concepts. 
I just have a few examples of the sort of mapping which I which I wanna which I wanted to learn. So atom is related to electron, proton, blah blah blah. And I have just I just added like six or so examples. Sorry, Emil, for this one. <laughs> and at the end, um, I just have this placeholder uh, which contains a topic is related to, and then it has to complete the pattern. This is what the code block at the end stands for. This is just a normal code block for markdown, like using the, the markdown syntax we're all familiar with. And by simply having this blueprint in a sense for this uh, for this skill, it can follow my my commands in a sense. And it automatically figures that uh, figures out that the topic in the first one is knowledge work, fills it in here, and then tries to complete the pattern. And this is how, and the, the output of this is piped back into the chat. So it's just sort of routed back as responses to my commands. Right, I have one more example with this approach. This seems a bit more involved, but it has the same structure. So I can now just give you a bit to go through the chat. Right, so this has the same structure. I'm asking it things. And here there are a few examples of how I want this to work. So I want to send in a question and get this sort of uh, response, which in this case, I, I want it sort of to tell me what's the connection between two concepts. And maybe I'm learning about two new concepts or something like that. And I, I want it to help me in this specific way. So I, I just try to, Add a few examples here, and I specify this um, this way in which it can, it can help me. This again, the command gets filled in with my whole command basically, and then this pattern of question answer answering gets completed. Right, but I I want to use this slide also as an opportunity to mention some other things. So you see here, I'm asking what's the connection between obsidian and note taking. It says obsidian is a cognitively ergonomic alternative to traditional note taking. Now. This might not be the most popular way of phrasing this <laughs> online. And this is because um, the, the model which is behind this isn't just a pre-trained uh, model which knows how to generate text. It, it has also been fine-tuned on my personal working notes. So before using it in this setup, uh, a model which knows how to generate text arbitrarily has been fine-tuned on my on my own vault essentially on my working notes so that's why it inherited this sort of uh it inherited my sort of style uh from writing notes and if if you'd be working with me this would definitely sound like something i would say um but there's also something else it gets out of this <clears throat> sorry out of this initial fine-tuning process and it also learns about entities and concepts which only I'm oh, yeah it's, let's say for in general entity so um, the initial model has been published uh, the pre-trained model has been published before obsidian uh, dual Rome research were a thing and somehow it knows that obsidian is an alternative to note taking and that dual is based on rust and that uh, both of those organizations which both formed after the initial model was uh, were was released uh, worked with AI. So basically, it has this knowledge from my own working notes, more or less, because it has been fine tuned on my knowledge base in a sense. And besides inheriting my general style of phrasing things, perhaps to um, academic, I don't know. It also learns uh, generally about various entities and general facts. However. Uh, one last thing on this slide if you uh, if you look at the last one how are obsidian and rome research related they're open source tools for cognitive augmentation um it's not completely true they're not like neither of them is open source and um this uh approach isn't designed in a way as to guarantee uh, correct facts so it tries to confabulate responses in a sense it tries its best to complete the pattern here and in this process, it also um, it pretends to know 
what it's doing, <laughs> but it's not all, it doesn't always uh, no. So here it uh, here's a mistake, and so on. But it's in the right ballpark generally, right? Uh, moving on. So I tried to show you how you can simply uh, using use a few examples to sort of specify a behavior you want you wanted to achieve. But I I'd like to give me a sec. I want to share another thing before I move on. Right, so this is just an online resource which lists some additional uh, tasks, basically, which have been phrased as text generation. So as you saw from my few examples from before, you can phrase many arbitrary tasks by simply having a prompt and asking this machine learning model to generate text afterwards. Mm -hmm. So in this example, you have uh, a function, uh, the signature of the function in, in Python. And by simply specifying this and asking it to generate what comes next, you sort of get uh, a model which uh, gives you code based on just a function signature and maybe a comment at the top. But most likely, this um, there are also some there might be some examples beforehand of this exact pattern, like uh, functions with the signature and the code, maybe more of them. And then there's this one, and you get this new thing, and you have to complete it, and so on. Here you get a natural language description of a SQL query for addressing a database, and you get the actual query in return. Or for a final thing, uh, here, you provide a few training examples in a sense to for a text generation model to learn how to sort of um, rephrase fancy legal uh, phrasings as in from contracts or whatever to plain English so that you can understand them easier. Right. I'll switch back to. Right. Um, yeah, so if if you can teach it few shot skills by providing a few examples, uh, you can teach it zero shot skills without providing any examples. And by simply trying to describe the task at hand, the task you're, you wanted to, to solve. Right, so this time have a look on the left first. So oh, let me get my, right. So this is a skill of answering open questions. Here, I have a code block, which is also a command, uh, which reads list notes about the topic. This, when, when it's being used, this skill, this simply expands, in a sense, to a set of several notes from my knowledge, from my actual vault, from my knowledge base, which are based on that topic. Again, the topic here gets uh, filled in automatically based on the topic of the question. Uh, and then I have this simple structure where I have Q, the question, which I'm actually posing to the virtual assistant, A, which is sort of like the answer comes next. And then I ask it to complete this pattern. And by simply having this little structure here, I'm telling him um, or her, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, first try to generate, build this context from, from my using my own knowledge base, then append this little structure here with Q in my question, and then try to generate um, the answer. And because of, of this structure here, completing the pattern means answering the question. So here I'm asking, what does it feel like to be a virtual assistant? And it says, it feels like you. Um, the task of conversational interfaces to abstract away the details of the heart or whatever. It's, it tries to confabulate its way through. Anyway, again, here also have a look on the left first. So I have a very similar structure to the previous skill. I'm asking it to find some relevant notes on a topic. And while we're here, this uses a related approach more or less to what Ben talked about in the initial presentation, as in the topic uh, gets embedded uh, into a certain representation and all other documents are also 
get their own embeddings. And as Ben talked about finding really similar documents, uh, this uh, listing of notes about a topic works by finding documents which have a similar embedding in a sense. It, it does work this way right now and it, the vast majority of, of situations in which you'd implement semantic search more or less, but we are working on also using the text generation model for semantic search in a, in a certain way, but that's really a detail and maybe during some obscure question in the question session. Right, but here I'm asking you to expand to build some context here, then append here's a list of questions related to the topic, which is basically the same, and complete the pattern. And basically with these three lines, I instruct it, I, I teach it to, to come up with, to quiz me essentially, to come up with sort of the beginning of uh, some flashcards, for instance, something like that. Um, so I don't know, have test me on dynamical systems. Dynamical systems most likely gets a field in here for the two instances of the topic. And then the result here is where does the input come from? What is the output, blah, 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 and so on. And this, uh, I, I can just give you a bit to go through this now. Yeah, so basically it's just question related to the topic based on my notes. And for the final example, which looks like this, this is again, has the same structure as the previous one. I'm listing some notes here. It searches for them and lists them here. Then it appends this, here are the key takeaways from this line of reasoning and then completes the pattern. Uh, and if I ask it, list the main points from my notes about the second brain, it goes first, blah, blah, blah. Second, blah, blah, blah. Third, blah, blah, blah. These are the key points from my notes about tools for thought. And it goes again, first, blah, blah, blah. So it sort of creates a laundry list of, uh, creates a, tries to enumerate the, the key takeaways in a sense. So it's sort of, um, sort of like a summary. I don't know, you can, obviously you can adapt it, this in all sorts of clever ways. Like here's a counter ar argument to, to what was mentioned before or something like that. Or, uh, the fallacies identified in this argument are this and this and this, or uh, places where I could learn about this topic mentioned here is the, uh, are the following. Anyway, um, right. So up until now, I mentioned a few uh, skills you can teach your virtual assistant by simply asking it to complete a pattern by generating text more or less, and occasionally by also searching for related notes. Uh, but sometimes you might want it to, to either, for instance, check, um, get you some true facts from say Wikipedia, that's what we'll do now, or uh, do some deterministic uh, maths or, or have some, some more traditional programmatic uh, instructions. Right, so here, if you first look through the chat right now, Right, so here I'm asking for things from Wikipedia, like uh, about various entities and certain properties of those entities, for instance, the director of the Godfather. And it gives me the actual, uh, the actual thing, can I? Right, so Wikidata is sort of this uh, spin-off of Wikipedia which is structured in a very machine friendly way. And for it has many, many entities as pages sort of here, and each entity has a bunch of properties. So this has nothing to do with the main thing I was talking about, but sort of this is an additional resource online. Director. Um, right, which gets uh, indexed. Um, like, uh, there's a request being made to this service to actually get who is the director of the Godfather. And this is just a general HTTP request. This can be a request to your to turn off the lights in your smart home or uh, contact someone else or send a message on a Discord server. This is just an HTTP request 
being like in the making here. And the way this works is I'm, con oh, I forgot my pointer, is I'm contacting, I'm asking this wikidata.org thing, they have this API and I can just sort of teach my virtual assistant to also uh, create this request as part of following my commands, which have this certain structure. And as you can see, there are certain parts of this snip, JavaScript snippet. This is just a JavaScript code block in vanilla markdown. And we're getting the syntax highlighting of JavaScript for free, basically, by using the existing markdown functionality. So in this snippet of JavaScript, you also see some placeholders. You also see entity here and property here. So we can use placeholders in the same way as in the previous skills, but they're just filled in as part of this piece of code. And then this uh, piece of code is just interpreted as it would like just as a normal JavaScript thing. And the answers again are routed back in the chat. Right. Um, okay, so what's next? When can I use this? Well, uh, so the things I, I showed you are functional but uh, they're based on, on, on a Python project. The problem with that is that it's really annoying to get new users to install Python, install uh, all sorts of libraries and so on. So right now we're working on just translating this uh, backend, let's say, from Python to Rust, which the only thing that matters here is that you can get like one file which doesn't need any installation at all. You can put it on your computer and you can just use this uh, natural language processing stuff without installing any obscure library. Uh, right, so if you want to contribute to this, it's again, it's based on TypeScript and Rust. The Obsidian interface is based on type, TypeScript and the backend which does the natural language processing is based on Rust. Yeah, just reach out and I'll show you around. And yeah, um, I th I'll just um, do a short demo now of actually using it. And then I, I am not sure now, but initially the plan was at the beginning of the q and session to sort of ask people to send in their Obsidian NLP wish list, like what they wish would be possible, but I'm not sure if we'll do that. We'll, I think we'll, I think Ben knows more about that anyway. Uh, right, and just to wrap up the, the, the presentation, the group, the small group behind this is uh, Psionica, and you can find more about it at this link. I also am trying to, uh, to get the demo working, but until now, I also added some useful links related to, to the presentation in here, if you want to learn more. And in the meantime, I'll get the the demo working. Okay, I think you can see this. Yeah, okay. So again, this is your average Obsidian setup. Here on the, on the right, there is this side panel. And dual shows up uh, just besides the this other side panel with four backlinks, and it's just part of the whole setup. And right now, I have this skill file open on the on the left, which is tell me what's twenty one times seven plus three. Let's see. Okay, this is nothing spectacular, but I want to, so I want to, in the following uh, examples, I want to keep it sort of niched to specific tasks because again, this model, which is behind the scenes has been fine tuned on my working notes, but also on my diary, because I can get, I didn't have uh, enough working notes to sort of have a large enough data set for, for this fine tuning process. So if any names or stuff come up, I'll just uh, reload and hopefully we can uh, keep it out of the eventual recording at the end. But otherwise I'll try to keep it pretty niche to, to certain skills. Uh, all right, so I have this really dumb skill of just evaluating this expression using JavaScript, which just takes that 
expression on the like like this. Okay, on the on the right, and just compute it. And just to show you that it's more robust, like there's no ready ready expression rule for getting the expression out. I can also try like determining what's like twenty one. Let's use the same one. Plus three, please. Okay, and if you if you got that, it also says typing while while it's working, and you get the same result. Uh, yeah, so it's not really a certain pattern which has to be matched. It's sort of fuzzy and versatile, right? But now let's try to so I'll switch from view mode to edit mode on the left. This is uh, yeah, I want you to ignore this part for now. It's some front matter metadata which is being used for okay, it's it's being used for two purposes. So this part is being used to determine when a certain skill has to be used, when a certain skill should be used. And it's also used to extract the, to fill in the placeholders, to sort of extract the argument. And it's just a bunch of examples of what sort of commands you'd use, uh, what sort of commands you'd issue when this, uh, so that the virtual assistant can use these skills. And the example commands are used, like the new command comes The reason you also list sort of the argument you know, which you're also using here, uh, is those examples are used behind the scenes in a sort of few shot way, as sort of sort of similar to the initial recipes to extract this expression properly. But this is not important for now. What I wanted to do here is I can just come in and write, uh, this is a result. And then this stands for the result of the first block in a sense, which in this case is just this JavaScript code block. And if, again, I just ask you the same thing, I get this and I, I don't have to compile anything or rerun anything. I just make a quick uh, change here in, in a note, which describes this specific, uh, this specific seal. And I instantly can ask it something and to use this, this, the new behavior in a sense. And I also have, one other thing relevant here. Um, right, so instead of this part at the end, let's say I have this little piece of markdown, which is a bit more involved. It has this heading, it has a sort of uh, unnumbered, unordered list, and so uses sort of the same information as before. I want to use this to show you. That so, if a skill results in some uh, some markdown being returned, this also gets rendered in the chat. So if the result is like a heading or a table or an image or something, everything just gets rendered as like markdown rendering in the chat. So there's room for being more flexible with uh, with formatting and so on. Anyway, but this is not uh, the core of of the project, right? Um, let me think of some other things I could write. So, so in here, I mentioned when talking about this in the slides, I mentioned that those two are also just commands you can issue in the chat yourself, but they're used on the left as part of uh, another skill. So it, you can also compose in a sense skills and they can build on each other, but I can just do list notes about, uh, learning and it will basically now look for related nodes from my own vault and essentially if it works hopefully uh yeah so essentially just responds with with uh, relevant nodes from my from my vault but this isn't the way you'd normally use like this is not particularly useful but you can just use the same command here on the left as part of another seal to sort of build some context but yeah, you can still look on the right and see uh, good learning is inherited pleasurable or uh, learning the skill. 
or a tutoring system. So those are all uh, related nodes in a sense. Uh, yeah, also with uh, the same, the same is true for write a, a paragraph based on, and this is the, the riskiest one yet uh, because it's really open-ended. So dual is a virtual assistant for knowledge work. I hope this goes right. Okay, it should take a bit longer because it's typing out the whole thing. Okay, and it says through a conversational interface, blah, blah, blah. So this is sort of like the a paragraph starts with this, though it's a virtual center for knowledge work, and then continues with this. And this is sort of like a, a building block for most skills, which work like this. Um, answers and responses can be different. Yeah, I don't know, it's mostly, like it's a work in progress and those models also are still getting better as the time goes by and various organizations yeah anyway and various organizations are working on like uh, for instance uh, emil brought up gbt3 and that's a really popular one but it's not that accessible to the public as uh, many know but uh, various organizations like Lyotor ai are working on for instance on open source replica of GPT-3. And we, we plan on just switching to, to their version once a uh, suitable one gets published, because for now, uh, the model which is behind all this is mostly GPT-2, and the predecessor of GPT-3, which, which can fit on your machine, and which can also be fine-tuned you know, with a moderate amount of resources as in just with a GPU or on a website or something like that. Uh, right, so let me, okay. Um, let me look for another one. Okay, so I have this one, which I thought would be sort of like, okay, I wanted to ask about the concept and I wanted to tell me what other concepts I should learn are necessary to learn in a sense before I can understand that concept or something like that. And I just, um, yeah, I just listed uh, some examples as in this concept of the synaptic cleft is based on neuron synapse neurotransmitters information and so on. So I should maybe get a good grasp on those before under, uh, understanding, before attempting to understand what the synaptic cleft is anyway. But let's say what's multi-threading based on. Oh no, okay, concurrency, multiple threads, multiple processes, anyway. So maybe I should uh, now look what concurrency is or something like that. Uh, I also copy this one because it's slightly longer. So I have an alternative phrasing of this more involved. I want to learn about multi-threading. What does it depend on? So there's some referencing there and it should work. Hopefully. Okay, similar results. Anyway, um, I'll just do a final one maybe. More open-ended. How does it feel like to be a virtual assistant using the answer open questions? And then maybe we can stop here. Hopefully it won't go nuts. Okay. It will be a long answer. Hmm. It's really torn on this one. Usually the, the, the way I'm trying to explain, I hope it's still working. Anyway, uh, the way I'm trying to explain the, the speed, the general speed at which this is operating is, I'm saying something like it types two to three times faster than an average human, <laughs> but I am not sure if it's still working on something or I think it's still working. Oh, okay. 
Anyway, I think I should reload first. <laughs> Maybe try a new one because I saw some little entities in there. And I, as I said, it's been fine tuned on some things. And let's just try again and then call it a day. How does it feel like? It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure if it talks about uh, itself or about me. Anyway, uh, so I think I'll stop sharing now. And that was, for the most part, what they wanted to show. I, I know it took a while. <laughs> Sorry for that. But yeah, I hope it was uh, uh, clear enough what's going on. Yep. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> That was insanely interesting <laughs> and very cool what this tool that you built can do. Um, I do, like it. do you have some questions about it? Um, Emil asked, with that Wikidata querying, um, how do you translate the natural language question into a SPA QL query? <laughs> right, so uh, can, for context, I can try to open it up again. Okay, so there is this slide. And um, I mentioned that, maybe I can come back to this, use my pointer here. So I mentioned that you have these placeholders, which is just reads entity. And here there's a placeholder which reads property. Those are filled in by this system behind the scenes when I'm asking you questions. And the and putting together a Spartan query, which is sort of what this weekly data endpoint uh, talks in. This is how it knows how to uh, understand what sort of data you want. This is really a, something really deterministic of just concatenating, concatenating some strings and putting the, uh, the property here and the entity there. And this is sort of what you might want to handle using some traditional code, and in this case, JavaScript. So uh, yeah, in this case, you have this uh, sort of uh, JSON dictionary thingy where you just put the entity in and you send it as the request parameters. But this is really specific to how Wikidata is working. But generally, you just, uh, if you have something really, yeah, which has to really rule based, more or less, not fuzzy in any way deterministic, you might want to use uh, JavaScript basically like this. Um, and another thing way of, of thinking about this JavaScript in a node, which might be useful, is it's sort of similar to that other Obsidian plugin templater, where you have sort of like some JavaScript thrown in there in the node, but it's slightly, it has a slightly different structure. This block here, this code block in the markdown document is just a JavaScript code block. Like we can have code blocks in markdown. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. So can you can you get the entity directly from your input question? Yeah. So um, this argument extraction, let's say, subtask mm -hmm. of answering a question, is handled behind the scenes by the system. And the way that is done, it's slightly more technical, but I can try to describe yeah, no, it intuitively. It's not needed to go into details, but is it basically rule based or is it no, also no, done by the GPT-3? No, to... it's basically all also done by the GPT-3. So I mentioned that every okay. skill has this has this um, structure in the this front matter part at the beginning, the metadata, which basically lists a bunch of examples of commands you'd issue, which you expect uh, the assistant to use this skill for. So if I wanted to sort of identify what concepts a certain concept depends on, I might ask it list dependencies of blah, blah, blah. What does this depend on? Enumerate the dependencies of GPT-2 uh, and so on. And I also uh, provide sort of the arguments. So below, I showed you that I want to use concept as a sort of 
parameter or argument or variable, whatever. Oh, wow. And I specify those for each example command. And actually those examples are used in a few shot way as examples of extracting the concept from the command. And then a new command comes in. How does it, um, yeah, um, I don't know, uh, what was it? Uh, what does multi-threading depend on? And then it gets, uh, it has this subtask behind the scenes, which doesn't really concern the user of, okay, if this is the concept from this query, and this is the concept from this query and so on, what is the concept from this new command sent in there in the chat, right? So you, you can like program based on, more or less based on this language model with a dual. Yeah, it's, it, it's slightly a different, it requires a slight, I don't know. Yeah, it's a difference. bit different. It's kind of uh, like, because you, you can basically assign variables, right? Something like that, but it's like Pretty for cool. someone coming from a computer science background, uh, having to sort of specify a behavior through examples is really counterintuitive, right? Like you usually specify an algorithm through code and it works and it's reliable and robust and deterministic. But here there are some small things you have to wrap your head around, which is, okay, so sometimes I have to provide examples for it to learn how to do things, which is slightly weird. And yeah, there are also some other things going on in here, but yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Very interesting. It, like, like you said, it is um, weird to have to teach it these like skills that we take for granted, like extract the concept from the sentence. Mm -hmm. Like we just know how to do that, but you have to you have to tell it that. Very interesting. Um, on one of the wish list points, um, B two B said that it would be very cool if you could get an image, more specifically a map as an answer. So if you ask like, where is Alexandria in Egypt located, it would show you that. And maybe just images as answers more generally. Mm -hmm. So if you, if that was a sort of task to, if in your knowledge base, if in your bold, you had various notes of regarding various places, let's say, this is what your vault is about. You could maybe have a skill which uh, finds a relevant note, similar to the list notes based on a topic, which simply prints the note uh, in, in the chat, for instance. And if the note contains an image, it will just get printed as an image in the chat, as you'd expect from, like, similar to how an image is sent in on WhatsApp or Messenger or something. Um, that, or maybe you would have like a specific skill of only getting the images out of out of a specific note or something like that. It's really up to you how you do this. Or oh, actually, Wikidata has a bunch of thumbnails for each entity, for most entities at least. So you could also phrase it as a yeah, this uh, entity just get me a relevant picture of it, and it just goes on the internet and finds a relevant picture, maybe from Wikidata, maybe from somewhere else, something like that. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Um, we have Itachi in the audience. I'm sure you, you know her from using Duo so much. Um, <laughs> she mentioned how she's like very impressed that the development has moved this fast. Um, and just personally, me too. I remember when you first posted it onto the Obsidian Discord. And like, I didn't really believe it at first. I was like, I don't know, how can this thing really do that? And yeah, I was very impressed. And, and it has moved very quickly. Um, perhaps, Kitsachi, if you're comfortable with it, maybe you can share a couple of examples of how you use Duo in your notes, um, if you're open to that. Otherwise, there, there are a couple of other questions. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me know if you'd like to say something on that. Um, otherwise, I'm curious about how with, with some of the like question types, you, you gave it the exact same input, the same question, but it gave you very different answers, like write a paragraph based on. Um, so is there like some amount of randomness involved? Is that just from the, the GPT model or something that you put in? So you can 
uh, use those models to generate the same text all over and over again. But that in a chat-like environment doesn't come across as very natural. Mm -hmm. If you would send <laughs> a message and get the same answer in return, you can also um, use a certain strategy, uh, again, quite behind the scenes to sort of introduce some amount of randomness in it and force it to try out a few different uh, styles of completing that set pattern. Now, there are some disadvantages to this, and mostly it's the fact that it's somewhat slower, as in you introduce some additional complexity in this whole text generation procedure, which itself is quite complex. And uh, if you would be OK with getting the same answer over and over and just using different prompts or something like that, it could be faster. But I thought the, the trade off here is quite clear that that randomness and diversity and trying to get various answers in return is quite useful. And we are already we already have this expectation of chatting with someone and we're OK with having to wait for a bit while it's typing, you know, and I thought <laughs> this could be repurposed, <laughs> exempted. Yeah. Mm. Also, thanks for using Duo for more than a month because it was really buggy. Uh, version back then. Uh, on that, you, you mentioned how, well, like you said, I, I hope it doesn't go nuts when you asked it like some more difficult, um, or gave more difficult prompts. What are some like, what's the worst case that it can come back with? Because um, like the answer to being a virtual assistant, like um, it was a, a bit more general. Uh, maybe that like wasn't the best answer, but like what's the worst that can happen? Um, so OpenAI actually got into uh, trouble for enabling basically a service uh, which got into trouble itself, as in they had this uh, RPG game, text-based RPG, which was which had GPT-3 behind the scenes, and users eventually got into some more um, sensitive um, content in a way, forced it to, to get into some specific niche, and they had a lot of bad press on that. Um, now some really low hanging fruit of making sure it's not completely inappropriate like the sensitive and so on is by uh, sort of asking it to generate some uh, multiple completions and choosing those which are safe and not sensitive and all that now the fact that it's it's initially fine-tuned on the user's working notes also helps with setting the general style and moods and and vibe and stuff like that it, it it's but it gets biased through this fine-tuning process to use your own words and your own way of expressing yourself so if you're using <laughs> um, you write some specific form of uh, fiction which uses some uh, specific words uh, maybe more uh, unsafe words it will uh, continue to work with that if it's what uh, if that's what it's fine-tuned on it's your specific content and dual the idea the original idea is that it's called dual because it's sort of your dual in a sense it's it inherits your self thinking to some extent by being fine-tuned on your content that's a quite a, a a major assumption but there's something to that like at least the style it's just uh, at least at this stage uh, of those models because they keep getting better. At this uh, stage, sometimes it looks like sort of a caricature of what you're, of how you're, how you're speaking, like introducing fancy concepts or something like that. It does come across as that sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so like without these content nets, it, it could actually be kind of dangerous. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, if you would. <clears throat> A possibility in the future would be to maybe expose your duel in a sense to your say your colleagues from a research team or something like that so that they could get an initial uh, chip without bothering you uh, asynchronous in a sense uh, like a response from you on some topic um yeah you might implement some harsh um uh, filters on the sort of responses it can come up with so um yeah, basically, because because let's not forget that this initial model, so like your vault of a thousand nodes, isn't isn't enough to sort of teach it how to speak uh, as 
fluently as it does. Initially, it has been fine-tuned on a bunch of texts from the internet. And that's, that always introduces the possibility of picking up some certain nuances from Reddit or something. And this should be kept in mind when maybe exposing your dual and um, referring to it as fine-tuned on your notes and stuff to, to the public or to some other peer. Because, I mean, that's, this is new territory, <laughs> but there are certainly some ways of tackling this. Yeah. Cool. Very interesting stuff. Um, ben asks, how large are these language models, um, like the file size of them? Mm -hmm. So uh, when you say GPT-3, for instance, it's not clear to what model you refer, actually, because GPT-3 is not one model, but a small family of multiple models of different sizes. And the largest one uh, can't, uh, needs many, many GPUs to can fit on one single computer. It needs a small server farm almost, but that's really one of the, the largest. And I mean, larger and larger ones keep on popping up uh, every week now, but uh, GPT-2, the version we are working with and which was in the demo and the size and everything is sort of like around a gigabyte something. And it runs on my laptop and that was the speed at which it runs using the CPU actually. Like usually you'd run those on GPU, but my laptop is not uh, that well equipped. So I just went with the, with the CPU and it takes, uh, yeah, it, it still is in the natural range in a sense of, of, a, of a conversation. Um, but yeah, I mentioned we might, we will switch to that open source replica of GPT-3 and we'll do that when a version which fits on an average consumer machine is available because right now, they're, they've been experimenting with uh, replicas of larger models, which aren't really immediately useful to us. Yeah. Could you um, like use the larger ones, but instead send uh, like a request to a, a, yeah, like a cloud server to do the, the computation for you? Yeah, definitely you could also set it up this way. It's sort of have a hosted service of just generating text, which is basically what OpenAI does. But uh, the Obsidian community is really into local first uh, setups and so on. And I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to experiment with having this stuff locally on your machine where it also has access to your vault and, and all that. And it's, a, it's, it's an interesting uh, place where multiple things connect as in your knowledge base, this, this model and so on. There might be an option in the future if this goes beyond uh, more or less hobby project and into a more serious uh, product maybe to offer this hosted option. But it, there are already multiple providers of this sort of generic text as a service. So it wouldn't be any looking and you would be like, you'd probably have to opt out of doing it on your machine and uh, use this paid hosted alternative. That's sort of like the plan. For sure, so it does come with pros and cons. Um, Kitachi has shared some of their use cases. They say they use Dual to help with writing essays, for example, um, and most of their use comes with content generation. Um, it's like an idea generator of sorts. So they mentioned how the proposed recipe generator will be very cool. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, just this idea of like, coming up with ideas is amazing. Like the research question, personally, I found very cool. Um, and just with the question now, um, like the process of changing the, the model will that become easier um, than having to replace the essence folder every time. Okay, so for uh, regarding your first, again, thanks for using it since the very beginning. And regarding your first message, I could definitely see a sort of skill of coming up with um, essay topics, for instance, like you'd, you could simply have, like in, all, in most, the, most of the examples I showed, you had sort of like arguments in there, like you had to figure out the topic or um, something like that, but you could also not use any, any arguments and just have a, a huge list of the sort of uh, essays you've written in the past and you, you're interested in. And the task would simply be um, like come up with a new essay idea and it would just generate based on a 
list of, of the previous titles you you generated you read, you've written before generated yeah <laughs> um yeah i've also seen like similar use cases for like coming up with um, ideas for youtube videos or stuff like that that's definitely a really doable thing for for this already and uh, regarding the feeding process so you're referring to so i mentioned this fine tuning process you would normally do this when you set up your tool in the first place when you have all your your complete knowledge base and so on but at some point after a few weeks or so a few months you eventually get new nodes and um, you change your interests and learn new things and so on and it it can still uh, work with new information information you just added five minutes prior in those skills which uh, which contain like list notes about something like it can all also like fetch really fresh notes in a sense recent notes and use them as context but there are two different ways in which your notes are being used to sort of influence or inform what this uh, assistant is saying so one is through this context and most of the time in in skills and the other one is through that initial fine tuning and yeah that's um um that's still uh, a challenge in a sense of making that uh, easy of uh, doing that fine tuning because right now it's uh, you can use a free online service but it takes like an an hour or so because it's still some training going on and it's still it's not trivial even if you only have like a hundred notes or so we preferably be more than that uh, maybe a few thousand it's not it's probably a few megabytes of data but it still takes quite a lot because it has to do all that fine tuning optimization and so on so i don't really have uh, a good answer for that one maybe like uh, some a random idea would be you could ha have sort of like this service maybe hosted service which did this like overnight or something or like replace the model without you um, noticing it, it as in fine tuning it and then when it's ready just swap it for a new one or something like that for using your, using your own machine if you have a gpu or something like that uh, but yeah that's a that's already a question of making it easier for users who have been using this for quite a while now and right now they're yeah right now it's uh, mostly people just onboarding but that will definitely be a challenge in the future yep all right um so i think at this point i'm going to stop the recording um because then maybe we can just get a few more questions without the, the pressure. Um, but before that, yes, um, I want to say thank you to our three presenters. Um, I've personally found this so interesting. Um, and yeah, so we will make this recording available on the YouTube. Um, yeah, thank you to Ben, to Emil and to Paul. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording and we can spend a little bit longer.